Hello and welcome to In Control, the first podcast on control theory. Here we discuss the science of feedback, decision making, artificial intelligence, and much more. I'm your host, Alberto Paduan, live from a recording studio in Zurich. Quick thanks to our sponsor, the National Center of Competence in Research on Dependable Ubiquitous Automation and the International Federation of Automatic Control. Our guest today is Naomi Eric Leonard, Edwin S. Wilsey, Professor and Chair of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at Princeton University. Welcome to the show, Naomi. Thank you, Alberto. It's a pleasure to be here. So today we're exploring quite a wide range of topics, such as how honeybees actually choose their nest site, or how do starlings preserve a given formation to escape predators, how political polarization emerges in a network of individuals, and especially what does dancing have to do with control theory? So I'm probably going to start with the last question to you, and then maybe we can move chronologically through your academic journey. So what does dancing have to do with control theory? Dancing has everything to do with control <laughs> theory, I think. Um, if you think about what goes on on a stage when you're watching a dance performance with many dancers who are moving together in beautiful patterns that may not have been choreographed in advance, they are nonetheless making decisions on the fly in response to what they're observing about their environment, about others around them. It's very much a, um, a collective motion <laughs> event. And at the same time, they're following a trajectory uh, and something that they rehearsed before. Perhaps, yeah. So in a, in a traditional choreographed piece, yes, they've, they've practiced it and they, they know uh, what they should be doing, but they're interpreting it and they're doing it in the presence of other people. And they have been trained to be extremely physically aware of what's going on around them and what others are doing. And so they can be quickly responsive to you know, how they're feeling about things and how others are feeling about things. So is dancing something that you practiced yourself also over the years? I did, yes. Okay. So I, you know, since uh, I, I, maybe I was around six, <laughs> oh. I started taking ballet lessons. Um, and, uh, but I loved it and I, I danced all the way up through my 20s. So I've been a serious student of dance and then um, so I would call myself a dance fanatic <laughs> ever <laughs> nice. since. So I'm, you know, I consume, <laughs> I'm a consumer of dance. And I've had this extraordinary pleasure of being able to collaborate with dancers and choreographers for, I think, over a dozen years now. So dancing is something that we will definitely touch upon over the course of our episode, perhaps later, because it's something that you've been doing recently, connecting systems and control theory to dancing. I, I thought so many of your projects like Flock Logic or Rhythm Bots are incredibly fascinating, but maybe we can take a step back and go through your chronological path. I, I looked at your biography and you know, from 1985, the, when you graduate for your bachelor, you go to industry, right? only to come back in 1989 to basically uh, get a PhD from the University of Maryland with Professor Krishna Prasad, who is a giant in control theory. I mean, he's worked uh, extensively on nonlinear control and geometric control. So maybe uh, I was curious to dig into a bit your early works. Uh, so what you studied over the course of your PhD and the ensuing years. Right. Well, I showed up at University of Maryland curious and excited to study control theory. I had, I had discovered it as an undergraduate and then explored it in industry. I worked in the electric power industry and came to a point where I wanted to learn more. And I went back and, uh, you know, I discovered Krishna <laughs> and uh, all that, um, you know, seemed possible. I mean, one of the wonderful things about Professor Krishna Prasad is that he is his true polymath. And it worked very well with me because I have very, you know, diverse interests. And um, so, as I was learning and starting to understand how to do research, I was constantly getting papers from him, from biology, from computer science, from neuroscience, from physics um, that were complementing what I was learning in electrical engineering. And uh, so I, my first research project was for my master's degree, and I worked on control in the presence of friction. That was interesting. And then um, 
when I finished that project, I moved on with Krishna to, to look into more geometrical problems in nonlinear control. So this was studying motion control for uh, systems, rigid body systems that had interesting kinds of symmetries. And the idea was to understand how to construct controllability. So we, we understood nonlinear controllability, how to prove whether a system was controllable or not. And we were exploring new ways to design control uh, using these notions of Lie brackets and how to construct a Lie bracket through. I was using oscillatory kinds of periodic inputs out of phase to create motion in new directions. So, for example, you know, the parallel parking car, but but also, you know, how do you reorient a, a, a rigid body like a spacecraft if you only have roll and pitch actuators available, but you want to make it yaw? Yeah, I mean, this is super fascinating. I have a sweet spot for these things because it's actually what attracted me to control when I first saw Lee brackets and the fact that with a nonlinear system, you can generate motion in a direction that is not within, let's say, the vector uh, vector fields spanned by basically the, the control system, then I was amazed. And and that's actually what attracted me to the field. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I can tell you that when I um, was preparing, just a few months before my final defense, I, you know, I said, I told Krishna that I would like to try it somehow, you know, in the real world. And so he put me in touch with Professor David Aiken, who had a big tank and he had uh, it was a space systems lab it was a neutral buoyancy tank so he had he had robotic systems and one of them had you know pairs of thrusters around each of the three directions of motion and i was able to test these algorithms in this tank of water it was really kind of amazing it must yeah. have been i mean actually so i was going through your phd thesis actually in preparing this episode and i spotted the following passage it's literally the last passage of your phd thesis where you say Additionally, it is of great interest to continue experimental testing of our algorithms, particularly for a system such as an underwater vehicle, where there are sensors which can measure position and velocity. And this is almost a preview to your future. Uh, I mean, this is, I, I guess, 1995 or 90... 1994. 94. I finished my degree, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, fast forward 2003 and 2006, uh, you are deploying underwater gliders in Monterey Bay. I mean, we're going to talk about it soon, but I thought it was very, very nice and fascinating somehow. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. I remember actually, you know, running these experiments and thinking, wait a second, <laughs> you know, I thought about this as a spacecraft looking at SO3, so rotations uh, in space. But of course, this, you know, rigid body is translating and it's in a body of water. You know, what might next <laughs> be explored for for bodies in a fluid. Just want to clarify maybe for our audience what we are talking about now. So basically Naomi has been using Lie groups, where we can mention them for I mean, they appear in the title of the PhD thesis. Uh, the title is actually Averaging and Motion Control of Systems on Lie groups. And Lie groups are basically natural, uh, how to say, representations of configurations in space of rigid bodies, basically. Lie group is just a, a group that is also a manifold. Yeah, and I, I'm not sure whether uh, averaging was actually present before you studying the subject. That, that is something that I don't know So on Lie groups. So, yeah, the idea was to extend these results about averaging onto Lie groups. Oh. So what does it mean to, to average a periodic signal of a system that's moving in the space of rotations and determine what the average behavior would be? And we're trying to figure out the average behavior because that tells us the net motion of the group. Um, from then onwards, I see that basically there's a series of papers that <laughs> you start publishing on the subject, many of which uh, single author, dedicated uh, essentially to exploiting these ideas in the context of underwater vehicles. You start interacting with a very impressive list of giants uh, in the field, among which Jerry Marsden, Anthony Bloch, Francesco Bullo, and, and many others. Maybe can you tell us a bit about what happened in, in those years? Right. So my PhD work was really a kinematic problem. It was it was thinking about how to combine velocities to get a net motion. But what I wanted to do when I arrived at Princeton was to learn and then exploit more about geometric mechanics in terms of the dynamics of, of rigid body systems. And uh, so that led me to study and also work with 
Jerry Marsden and Tony Block, who, as you said, are giants in the field. And uh, it was really super inspirational and exciting to be working with them, trying to understand problems that had been inspiring and exciting for me and new f- for them, these applications of um, of the theory in the context of bodies, uh, rigid bodies uh, moving in a fluid um, in an idealized setting. So we were looking at Hamiltonian, uh, Lagrangian formulations of these rigid bodies and trying to understand what that meant in terms of control of motion and led me to think a lot about controlling underwater vehicles became sort of a big part of what I did those early years. So, yeah, m- maybe we can actually explain, well, why is it fun or, or difficult or both uh, controlling those vehicles? I mean, I, I was reading a lot of these papers and trying to understand a bit also the, the, the concepts. First of all, I learned that, I uh, feel a bit naive in saying this, but the center of buoyancy is not necessarily the center of gravity. And therefore, you have potentially instability already arising from there. I should define maybe what is uh, the center of buoyancy is point within a fluid where the buoyant force can be considered to act, whereas center of gravity, same thing, but with gravity. Exactly. Yeah, so there were a couple of really interesting things that that emerge when you look at um, a, uh, a rigid body in a fluid as opposed to, you know, out in space. And uh, the first is the idea of added mass. So in a kind of idealized setting, instead of having a scalar mass, you suddenly have a, a tensor uh, for mass. So you can crudely think about it as, you know, you're, you're, you know, if you think about, say, an ellipsoid, you know, you're pushing, um, you know, in, inertia in different directions is going to be related to kind of the, the surface area in that, yeah. in that direction. And that already makes things really, really interesting in terms of stability and how the moments of inertia with respect to rotation combine with these, you know, the moments of this added mass inertia uh, tensor. But then the other piece has to do with the sort of the writing moment of gravity. So you have this force pulling you up, the buoyant force, and uh, force pulling you down, that's gravity. And, you know, if the gravitational force is above, <laughs> the, the buoyant force is going to want to f- flip over. So, yeah. But it also plays a, a role in stabilizing it. So... I, I just wanted to explore this and understand it all. <laughs> and we, you know, with one of my students, Craig Wolsey, who's now a professor at uh, Virginia Tech, we um, we even ran a whole bunch of experiments with falling bodies in a fluid and rotating bodies in a fluid. And uh, it, was, it was super interesting to understand. And it, it let, you know, it kind of gave me, it was always an excuse to learn something new. So I you know, I learned about mechanics and symmetry, and I, you know, I also started learning about um, uh, nonlinear dynamics, the kinds of um, behaviors you could get, and how to analyze those kinds of systems, and then also, you know, sort of connect it with real-world problems, and you know, what did it mean to control vehicles, uh, you know, not just in my tank, but in, you know, in the ocean, and you know, introduced me to sort of the world of, of oceanographers, and it led me to the next phase of my work, which were on a particular kind of underwater vehicle called an underwater glider, um, which so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we certainly have to talk about the Monterey Bay deployment of these yeah. gliders. I just want to pause maybe a, a little longer on the subject of stabilization of underwater vehicles, because I, I found a couple of publications that I thought were incredibly cool, especially the one with, uh, again, Anthony Block and Jerry Marston on the matching theorems, uh, uh, the, the, the concept of controlled La- Lagrangian. Actually, I should also make a small digression about these tools. We could argue that are a bit, uh, I mean, it's a difficult language to learn, we could argue. But I guess once you understand it, then it becomes a beautiful world that allows you to understand how the everything moves around you, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I would say... You know, these tools are, you know, there is a learning curve to learn, you know, differential geometry and to learn geometric mechanics, but it's it only seems challenging because it's not something that we are necessarily prepared for. But I think once you get over the hump, it's really, it's it's absolutely beautiful. And, and it's so, um, I mean, because it is geometric, it's something that you can actually visualize, you know. So to be able to visualize, I find, is just really uh 
I don't know. It's illuminating, <laughs> and it, it and it's inspiring, and it, and you can you, you know you can talk about it, and you can think about it abstractly with the the aid of the visualization. I, I fully relate. Yeah, m- maybe going back to this idea of controlled Lagrangians. So, what is a controlled Lagrangian? So, a controlled Lagrangian refers to a Lagrangian that has the actual mechanical system, kinetic energy, and well, maybe I should start from the beginning. So, uh, Lag- sure. what's the Lagrangian? So, the Lagrangian. Yeah, that's, a good, that's a good point. Yeah. So, for for a mechanical system, there are multiple ways to write down the equations of motion. You can write down them the equations of motion using a Newton's second law, or you can use Lagrange's equation or Lagrange equations. And so, for that, you write down uh, the Lagrangian, and the Lagrangian is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And then we know how to compute the derive the equations of motion from that, and So our starting point was we started with some kind of mechanical system. I mean, it could be, say, the inverted pendulum on a cart, and we can derive those equations of motion. And then the idea was, well, we have an opportunity to inject a control. So we could inject any kind of control for sure, but our idea was, well, what if we injected a control that, uh, that derived from, say, an additional term or terms in the... Lagrangian. So what if we added sort of a virtual term to the Lagrangian, call it the controlled Lagrangian, and then write down the Euler-Lagrange equations that correspond to it, and we get the uh, contr- the control law. So the trick was that we're, it wasn't so obvious how to do that from the start, because, in, for example, in the inverted pendulum on a cart, you can only put input into the, um, you know, you're only controlling a force on the cart, you're not controlling the pendulum. So the matching theorem had to do with determining systematically what kind of control laws, what class of control laws, or what class of, um, you know, how to write down a Lagrangian function that would give you control laws that would live in the space that was actually available to you with, you know, where you had control authority. So it would give you your control law, but you also want as, as much freedom in that control law so then you can design it for whatever properties you want the closed-loop system to have. Yeah. So it's a, it's a restriction on the class of controls, but it gives you this amazing tool because we know there are these beautiful uh, theorems about proving stability of mechanical systems. So one is called the energy Casimir function where you create a Lyapunov function that's not just energy but also some kind of polynomial function of conservation laws which are in the language of geometric mechanics called Casimir functions. And so what this allowed us to do was to to do this not just for the open loop system, but to do it for the closed loop system. So we were sort of living in this space of controlled mechanical systems that they themselves appeared sort of virtually like still a mechanical system. So for example, to stabilize an unstable spin, you would be introducing a gyroscopic kind of control law, which would derive from a modification to the kinetic energy. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could also, I mean, sort of maybe more familiarly is the addition of, of an artificial potential, and that would allow you to do maybe to control the cart somewhere. But, you know, it was really interesting because it was this sort of generalization of this notion of artificial potentials, but we really think about artificial kinetic yes. energy terms um, to get the kinds of gyroscopic forces that we needed to stabilize inverted pendulum or the the rotating rigid body or the rotating and translating underwater vehicle. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a lot of comments and questions because this is a super fascinating subject. But first of all, I should mention that there will be a link in the description to all the papers that we mentioned. In those papers, the, the ones that are, we're speaking about now, so Control Lagrangians and the Stabilization of Mechanical Systems, part one and two, on the transactions of automatic control, you have a lot of examples that are very cool. I think uh, it's uh, the papers are very, I mean, for what it's worth, <laughs> very well written in the sense that you guide the reader first through the simplest possible non-trivial example where you have a pendulum on a cart, as you say, but then you have very complicated mechanical systems because then you switch over to spherical pendula and then spherical, even spherical pendula on an inclined plane in the second part, which is, uh, I mean, uh, not very intuitive to me <laughs> how, how to stabilize. Um, one comment that I have is, uh, so you essentially exploit structure from the system in order to get a structured uh, controller that maybe enhances robustness or it's uh, easier to, to stabilize the, the system. 
I was wondering whether Hamiltonians also, I mean, why is Lagrangian framework preferable to the Hamiltonian one? Is there any value in doing one or the other? No, I mean, we certainly did a, uh, I mean, you, you can find another paper that we did on the um, Hamiltonian side, and there was also a, a parallel line of research. Um, Ariane van der Skaft and Romeo Ortega were doing some very beautiful work kind of in parallel with us. I think, you know, we developed the Lagrangian version in part because it was sort of a natural way to introduce control inputs, but we did do a lot of work on the Hamiltonian side too, especially with the rigid bodies. I'm just wondering whether there's any value in taking one perspective or the other. Are they equivalent or, um, I don't know, I'm just putting myself in the shoes of of the audience now. Um, I think, you know, we found that for designing control and making the systematic um, methodology work, uh, the Lagrangian, the controlled Lagrangian was a kind of a natural choice. But I think, you know, one could, you know, the, using Port Hamiltonian systems and understanding how controls enter and from the Hamiltonian framework is sort of equally as valid. The other comment that I have is that there is a, uh, following this paper, there's a series of papers where you demonstrate actually this approach on any sort of mechanical system that one can imagine. So unicycle with a rider, furuta pendulum, underwater gliders. And this actually leads me to what happened in Monterey Bay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's 2003, but maybe I should let you describe why you were in California. Yeah, I mean, I think I need to back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I had been studying underwater vehicles and control of underwater vehicles, but through this perspective, this sort of geometric mechanics perspective. And, you know, as we were playing around with these rigid uh, bodies, you know, spinning them and dropping them in, in a fluid and trying to understand our theory relative to what we were observing, you know, I had this idea to actively control buoyancy, right? That's something that, or, or you know, the, the force acting on the body, uh, the net force. So you can, you know, make a vehicle buoyant or you can make it heavy by changing the relative um, uh either the mass or the volume. And you can also change, by moving something around inside, you can change the distribution of mass, and that changes, you know, whether you pitch or roll. And um, so we ended up um, with a student, Joshua Graver, we ended up building our, a little, um, it, it looked kind of like a wing, <laughs> and it had eight syringes inside, and it drew in water and expelled water each one of those syringes independently. Okay. So we just were playing around with these ideas of being able to make something go up and down and essentially glide up and down, but it could also <laughs> spiral up and down. And, you know, I, and I knew that, you know, we didn't really want uh, surfaces moving on the outside because if something was going to be in the water for a long time, you know, things can grow and then things could get stuck. And so, you, you know, having the actuation inside. So we we just explored actually in a little tank of water, you know, this actually we maybe have brought it over to the swimming pool as well. Just, um, you know, this ability for, it was kind of fun, you know, you're looking at this, this wing-like structure and you see it spiral down and then you see it spiral up and you, but you can't see the actuation because it's all inside. But essentially you're just making it you know, heavy pitch forward roll, and then it and then it spirals down. It's pretty much the same principle that a scuba diver uses, right? Yeah. Uh, to go up and down, so you inflate or deflate your lungs, uh, but you were doing that with a robot, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, so I learned it was actually um, sort of Tom Curtin, who was the person at um, the U.S. Office of Naval Research, who was funding some of my work, who sort of super inspired and inspirational person kind of explained to me, you know, that it's, you know, all well and good to study a single one of these gliders, but the real power comes in putting them together en masse because they're slow and they're not super maneuverable. But if you could put them together and have them essentially move as a swarm or, you know, in some kind of coordinated way, you could do what he was really interested in doing was was collecting data about the ocean and, and using that to serve questions that oceanographers and ecologists were studying in the in the ocean. And, you know, I learned about three different groups in the, the U.S. who were developing these ocean-going gliders and, uh, you know, sort of built on this original vision of uh, 
having a, uh, actually, the, so the original vision was of something called a thermal glider, which was meant to go from Cape Cod to Cape Town. Wow. <laughs> and, That's a long um, journey. Yeah. So the idea with the thermal glider was that there would be some kind of, um, you know, hydrocarbon that would be, um, you know, um, liquid at a surface and um, solid. I mean, it would it would basically change oh, wow. change volume, and it would essentially be enough to pump uh, some oil into a bladder, you know, down below, so that you'd become buoyant and you could come up. And then the only sort of battery you'd need is to flick the switch and empty the bladder again, and then you would glide down. Wow. Um, and so you're essentially using the thermal gradient in the ocean to to propel you. I mean. By the time I got there, they were, you know, they were electric gliders, so, but they were still doing things very efficiently. So, yeah. So, I mean, the Slocum glider used change in buoyancy and also moving mass to control the, you know, the pitch and and whether you're going up and down, up or down. And then they have a electric rudder in the back. So everything that we're talking about now is reported in a paper uh, published on the IEEE Journal of Oceanic Engineering. Mm -hmm. The title is Multi-AUV, not UAV, AUV, uh, and <laughs> Autonomous Underwater Vehicles, I guess, Control and Adaptive Sampling in Monterey Bay. So it describes how you deployed this fleet of autonomous underwater gliders in Monterey Bay in 2003. This is part of an, I think, ASA P program or something? Yeah, uh, the first program was called AOSN, uh, uh, Autonomous Ocean Sampling Network. Okay. And then the second program was called ASAP, because Adaptive there is a second, Sampling. Yeah. Okay, then there is a second phase where you second actually, phase. in 2006, you deployed again this fleet of underwater gliders, but this time also, as you say, in, in a coordinated fashion. So the, the gliders had to maintain some sort of formation in order to do adaptive sampling in an efficient way. Yeah, so the first experiment was in 2003. Tom Curtin had gathered us in 2002 in his office in Washington. He brought together four of us, uh, one uh, Jim Bellingham, who was you know, chief engineer at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and Alan Robinson, who's an oceanographer who develop models for collecting data, assimilating data into these big codes using Navier Stokes to predict nowcasts and forecasts about ocean, you know, physical and even biological properties. And um, David Frattentoni at Woods Hole, who had these ocean going slocum underwater gliders, and he asked uh, the four of us, and he told us he would augment with lots of other people. So we ended up working also with Russ Davis um, at Scripps who had a fleet of spray, he called them spray gliders, and also an oceanographer, physical oceanographer. The goal was to go into this pretty large volume of water outside of, uh, Mont in and around Monterey Bay, to collect data during what's known as an upwelling event. So this was over the month of August in 2003, when cold water comes up from the bottom because of the ocean physics and brings with it minerals and nutrients and the phytoplankton come and collect. Oh, okay. So they need the, the nutrients. And so there's this, you know, all Life kinds. Life is blo blossoming yeah, at that time. Yeah, there's some all kinds of spectacular things going on that they were studying. And there was a whole group of um, ecologists at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute who were interested in understanding the coupled physics, so temperature, salinity, currents, and then what was going on with uh, the phytoplankton and how that was affecting the ecosystem, how that might be affecting, you know, global climate, <laughs> right? Because I mean, what a wonderful project. <laughs> it was fantastic. It was so, it was fantastic. It was really my first time doing a, a true collaboration and, you know, learning about the questions that these scientists were asking, what made them tick, what was interesting, you know, what we're going to be, you know, if we were going to collaborate, you know, I was interested in you know, making these vehicles collect the kind of data that they needed most efficiently and using tools from systems and control theory. But I also became absolutely fascinated with their questions, which is sort of the the key to any kind of collaboration. And and I found kind of in return, you know, as we we started to work, you know, we really became a team and they would push me and they'd say, well, why can't you just do this? Or, you know, and I'd have to think, well, why can't I do that? And <laughs> we, you know, we had these debates about uh, how often the vehicle would be allowed to be on the surface because we had very challenge, you know, serious challenges in how they would be able to essentially 
pass information from one to the other. And so I was always fighting for like a slightly higher sampling rate for the feedback. Yeah. And they were always, you know, trying to push in the other direction because if the if the vehicles were sitting on the surface, which is the moment we were able to communicate with them through Iridium satellite, they were also not collecting data. They're moving around because the currents are the biggest on the surface. So we had this really interesting tension, but it, it made me reflect and think about how do you yeah, how, how do you deal with it? Stimulated theoretical questions like you didn't you did in practice have very limited communication uh, in order to yeah. maintain uh, patterns, given patterns with these yeah. robots. Also, I was curious how were the robots interacting? Like what sort of sensing capabilities and communication capabilities did they have? Yeah, so the, I mean, in 2003, our goal was to um, show, we had just been, you know, with my students, we had been developing um, theory to uh, understand how a, a group could move in a coordinated pattern and estimate together the gradient in the field that it was sampling and then move along that gradient. So we were interested in helping the, the, the scientists, the oceanographers, they were really curious about where the cold water was going after it upwelled. <laughs> and so we wanted to sort of, there were a lot of gliders, maybe a dozen at a time, but what we did just kind of essentially proof of principle in the real field <laughs> environment would, would be to, to you know, for, you know, several days, take, you know, maybe three of them. So, you know, so for us, control we control theorists, you think, okay, three, I'm, I'm moving through. But to do that in the ocean, remember, these are going up and down and up and down. And, strong currents. Yeah. And um, I, I learned from my oceanographer colleagues that if I were to try to estimate anything, you know, the right resolution would be to have them something like three kilometers apart from one another. So this wow. is a triangle with with, you know, gliders moving together uh, three kilometers apart so that we would get the right kind of, um, you know, uh, resolution. I mean, if they're too close, they're not, you know, they're not able to, to get any kind of gradient information. If they're too far apart, it's not, not useful. So you need to know the right scale. Uh, I mean, we had developed, in fact, we demonstrated this. We had developed methodology that allowed us to not just, you know, track a gradient that we were estimating from three or more vehicles, but also to optimize the resolution so that we could minimize the effect of, of you know, noise in this in the data. So, Amazing. yeah. So we demonstrated the ability of these guys to estimate these gradients, and it was really exciting. I mean, I re I remember that moment. We were in the control room, which was above a restaurant, uh, like a fish store, a fish restaurant in Moss Landing, which is right kind of at the base of Monterey Bay, and um, one of my students or postdocs put up on the screen kind of a realization of where the vehicles were at that moment. And, you know, we were getting the information back from them through Iridium satellite. And so we could, so so he was plotting on the screen, you know, the arrows <laughs> in the direction of the cold water. So minus the gradient of temperature as measured by the vehicle. And I remember you know, one of the oceanographers saying, well, we knew that, Naomi. <laughs> and then I really got excited. I said, that's the whole point. <laughs> you know, you, we could have not been here. We could have been, you know, <laughs> back home and the, the gliders would have known. Um, and they knew, he knew that because they were getting satellite images. So, but what was really interesting was that the satellite images told you the cold water on the surface, but these were giving us, uh, you know, uh, at any, you know, at any depth. depth, like we were doing sort of depth average, but you could get it, you know, 10 meters, 50 meters, 100 meters. Um, I think we were at, in that experiment, we were going down to 200 meters. So In an autonomous fashion. In an uh. autonomous fashion. I can remember that moment. It was <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> That's been incredible. I, I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I think I probably literally jumped up and down. <laughs> uh, but that, that, that was really, and it was sort of during those conversations, I mean, we were, I mean, there was something to be said for actually having us all physically together for some periods of time in the control room because, or, or you know, just while the vehicles were out there. I mean, it's kind of an interesting thing, you know, you go on a little boat and, uh, you you know, you get the gliders ready, you sort of gently push them off and then you don't see them for a month, right? But they're doing their thing so loyally and dedicated to what we've told them to do. And, uh but, you know, you sort of feel like that you're nearby in case something goes <laughs> wrong. And uh, and then you get to see these, you know, because they're uh, communicating back to us, we know, you know, how they're doing. And um, 
It was very exciting. But but there were lots of conversations. In fact, one of the conversations with um, Dave Fratchenhoney led to the whole next sort of body of work and experiment. And that was, you know, this question. Um, so sort of meanwhile, while we were doing these gradient climbing experiments, he was running these vehicles in certain patterns so that, it, but it was open loop. So he was running them, you know, sort of instructing them open loop to move around sort of closed curves because they wanted to get repeated measurements, mm -hmm. but they wanted to essentially cover. This is a coverage problem. Yeah. They wanted to cover an area because they're, they're, you know, you have limited resources and you're mm -hmm. collecting, all the data we're collecting goes in near real time to, we had three big ocean models running, one from Harvard, one from NRL, one from JPL. Um, and so it's like weather forecast, but this is ocean forecast. So you want to know what's going on now, but you want to predict, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, what the conditions of the ocean are going to be. And there's all kinds of really incredible usages of that. I remember that the, there was the tsunami and we learned from the folks at NRL that their code was being used to help understand under what circumstances they could bring in rescue boats and look for people. Uh, rather, I mean, so rather than being so, so conservative, right, they yeah. actually could figure out that there would be this window of time because they were just constantly predicting what the, the currents would be like. And um, so fascinating. I mean, <laughs> that's sort of one of the things that drives me is I want to do things that are going to be helpful and make the world a better place. And and it, also yeah. this tension between the amazing theory that you do and the experiments, I, I, I find it incredibly fascinating. Uh, you anticipated one of my next questions, actually, because, you know, in reading your journey, basically, through publications, I was wondering whether this was actually the moment that ignited a fascination for you for uh, uh, biology or collective motion in biology? Or uh, was it something that you already had in the back of your mind and then suddenly around these years you started digging into uh, this subject? Uh, I started on a project sort of in parallel with this. So I think kind of at the same moment that Tom Curtin was giving me his vision of multiple underwater gliders as a sort of a collectively intelligent system for observing the ocean and its dynamics. I started a project with Steve Morse and Roger Brockett and uh, Peter Belhumer and uh, also two biologists, Danny Grumbaum and Julia Parrish. So they study, they study all kinds of animals, but it's you know, schooling fish uh, was one of them. And uh, so we were already thinking about, I think the project was con called Control of Groups. We were already thinking about what is, you know, what's going on. I mean, if you look at the behavior of fish schools, it's just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, <laughs> and, you know, and they're, they're obviously foraging. They're foraging just like, you know, I wanted these gliders to be foraging for information. The, mm -hmm. the fish are foraging for food, but they're also avoiding predators and they're um, doing all kinds of things that... Uh, you know, we could only dream of doing with our vehicles. All operating with milliwatts uh, computation <laughs> yeah. power, I guess. Yeah. I think also around the same time, I met uh, Simon Levin, who's a mathematical biologist, ecologist at Princeton, and also Ian Cousin, who's a, an experimentalist, both, you know, super creative, amazing people. And so they were at, at Princeton. And so we also started conversations and collaborations with so sort of all at the same time. And I think, you know, just this idea of going into the ocean with many, you know, like a, it's a mobile sensor network and really thinking about trying to, you know, think beyond what one could imagine. I mean, you know, the, it's just a kind of an incredible creative outlet, <laughs> a way to, to think about um, connecting what we can learn from the natural world to design and back. That's what's also really interesting. That's what you know, I find the brilliance of, of people like Ian who are so excited to actually learn about what we do and take what we do. I mean, even testing things in the ocean can inform the way they think about their systems and the questions that they ask. And so it's really this two-way conversation that we have continued to have over the decades. <laughs> Maybe I should mention for the audience uh, a few of the publications that they can consult if they're interested in this research. Again, there will be links in the description, but just in case I saw that one related publication is concerning what we talked about also before, cooperative control of mobile sensor networks, adaptive gradient climbing in a distributed environment, 
Also, I guess on the proceedings of the IEEE, this is a bit further in time though, in 2007, uh, collective motion, sensor networks and ocean sampling, where you do uh, report a bit of, on, on these topics. And yeah, it, it seems like from this moment, more or less in time, you do, I, I mean, I, I see um, more biological experiments or biological themes, if you want, appearing in your records. And I, I don't know if I'm wrong, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but June 2003, I see there's a workshop on cooperative control on Rhode Island. And uh, it seems there you have a paper with Derek Paley, Rodolfo Sepulcre, and Ian Cousin called, I guess, Collective Motion and Oscillator Synchronization or Spatial Models of Bistability in Biological Collectives. Uh, I don't know wh whether uh, one or the other came before, but there it seems like it's almost a manifesto of what you're going to do for the next, uh, seems, decade almost. Or even more. Absolutely. Yeah, I think a lot of things came together there. Rodolf Sepulcher spent um, a year sabbatical, 2002-2003. So okay. right in the midst of us preparing for this big experiment and the work that we did with Derek Paley, who was my graduate student then and who's now a professor at the University of Maryland, really sort of, you know, it certainly led to what we did in the next experiment in 2006, which is very well documented in that I, proceedings of the IEEE paper sort of lays out the, the, all the ideas and, and the theory and how we connect the different theories. And then we have a paper in the, um, the Journal of Field Robotics in yes. 2010 yes. that explains what happened. But so this sort of grew out of this conversation during the 2003 experiment, you know, where uh, Dave was making these having these gliders go open loop around, you know, around a closed curve because he wanted data at that scale and repetitive data. And he said to me, well, can you tell me how to control them so they don't all move with the currents because the currents were basically all making them congregate in a particular place. So he, he wanted to kind of de decluster them. And um, I said, yes. <laughs> and, you know, so it was this became sort of a focus of, of, both, you know, I mean, I was, I, I don't know which happened first, but it was sort of completely consistent with what we were doing. Rodolphe had come to really think about rhythm and synchrony, and we were developing this methodology using a spatial extension of the Kuramoto model of oscillators to understand how to not just synchronize, but court, you know, stabilize a whole range of spatial patterns. Spatial basically. patterns. I mean, we looked at, you know, polarized motion, but we were particularly interested in motion around closed curves. Yeah. And in particular, how you would stabilize patterns, for example, have them uniformly distributed as they moved around closed curves, yeah. which fits so beautifully with the problem that we were trying to do, which was essentially a, a coverage problem. We were trying to figure out how to get our vehicles, this was for the experiment in 2006, into patterns that would allow us to collect data with maximal entropic information or minimize the uncertainty in our ability to to sort of come up with a map of temperature or salinity or currents. And, you know, one could start from the sort of the brute force approach, you know, take the kind of, you know, the metric for uncertainty and just kind of sort of have the vehicles climb, you know, brute force climb the gradient, so maximizing entropic information. However, that leads you to basically spaghetti paths, as we <laughs> called it. And the oceanographers were, did not want spaghetti paths, and they really wanted paths that w uh, were clean. And, and, and certainly, actually, if you came up with some kind of optimized trajectory and then you had a, a vehicle try to follow it, a vehicle that one of these underwater gliders, it could be very many meters away from exactly what you wanted, and you would have no way to kind of predict whether you were at the you know the peak of your, sure. your objective function or if you had really fallen off the cliff. So yeah. what we did instead was to take the theory uh, that we had developed with Derek and Rodolphe, which was these patterns, and then use those patterns as our sort of structured set of solutions for optimizing the entropic information or minimizing uncertainty and uh, sort of optimize over parameters that were most important. So in that 2007 paper, we show, you know, that what matters is how they're distributed around this path as opposed to, um, you know, sort of exactly where that, that path yeah. is. And 
So we explored that uh, both, you know, sort of in theory and then in the experiment. But the, sort of the fundamental idea is that we have this, you know, uncertainty measure that we're trying to minimize, and we care about both sort of the spatial length scale, right? You don't want to, if you have sensors, you don't want them to be too close because they become redundant. You don't want to be them, have them be too far. Otherwise, you miss something. But we had to also do that in time because temperature is changing and... And so we, you know, you take a measurement, you want to get out of there as fast as you can, but you want to get back there at the at the temporal length scale so that you you don't miss something. And so the models that you analyze in this series of papers basically is the model of a particle in, in 2D plane, we could call it. And it's incredible how r rich the range of behaviors this fairly simple model, at least from, from the looks of it, uh, can exhibit. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, now I'm going to, also mentioned some of the titles of the papers that touch on this topic, but uh, what I wanted to say is that it seems like in this series of papers, there's all ingredients for your future research to come. So collective behavior inspired by nature, instability as a footprint of decision-making, and bifurcation theory and singularity theory that I hope we're going to touch on to study such phenomena and uh, trying to understand how, yeah, basically animals or biological entities out there make decisions very efficiently. Yeah, so the papers that we're talking about now are, of course, I mean, there, there's a series. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that I'm going to do justice to your work, but stabilization of collective motion in three dimensions, uh, consensus approach, autonomous rigid body, attitude synchronization, alternating spatial patterns for coordinated group motion. I already mentioned collective motion, sensor networks, and ocean sampling. But of course, also stabilization of planar collective motion, all to all communication. So this is the work that you were mentioning also with Rodolfo Sepulcre and Derek Paley, where people can find this um, 2D model of movement that relates to Kuramoto oscillators and its extension called uh, stabilization of planar collective motion with limited communication that I guess has a lot to do also with these experiments that you were doing in the field. Okay, so from now onwards, I have noted down an incredible series of papers each of them relating to very fascinating experiments involving animals. And honestly, I don't know where to start. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here I noted down maybe 2009, 2011, dynamics of decision-making in animal group motion, as well as a science paper called Uninformed Individuals Promote Democratic Consensus in Animal Groups. I don't know whether you want to talk about one or the other, but I thought it was fascinating to touch on both the theory and the experiments and so in from this research. Right. Yeah, so we, you know, we did so many things with animals early on and I became so inspired by, um, you know, the kinds of things, for example, that Ian Cousin was doing to both with models and with experiments to essentially, you know, sort of suss out, <laughs> you know, some of the basic mechanisms that allowed him to begin to understand how these, I would say, relatively simple individuals, I mean, I still think they're, as individuals, quite incredible, but, you know, so, or maybe better said, you know, how they can uh, use the, what limitations they have on sensing and computation and actuation as individuals lead to this kind of incredibly powerful behaviors as a group. So the kind of sort of robustness plus responsiveness and resilience. So how do they know, you know, how do they distinguish between unimportant fluctuations and signals that they really have to respond to? I mean, these are just incredible things that, you know, he knew very well they could do and he's trying to understand and uh, he and others, of course. So yeah, so that you mentioned the paper early on where we, we looked at and discovered a bistability that was really important. So there's already this idea of thinking about bifurcations. And there was a paper in 2005 in nature that Ian published with Simon Levin and uh, Jens Krauser and maybe Nigel Franks. I, I can't quite remember, but um, so it was a numerical, it was a simulation paper, but, you know, sort of brilliantly constructed, try to really understand essentially the parameter range that was so incredibly revealing. So it was a problem of looking at a group of planar movers again. So still okay. so closely related to things we'd been uh, developing in our own theories kind of why we were in conversation with them and writing papers already so early, but uh, looking at individuals using this kind of um, uh, the, the, the old Boyd model of, you know, an individual 
focal individual would have sort of a repulsive <laughs> a reaction to somebody too close to avoid collision. And if, you know, if they could scent them, but they were a little too far, they would move towards them, sort of an attractive force. And then okay. when they were kind of a, like a body length away, they would align. And so, you know, these, using these kinds of rules, um, he set free a group of these planar movers that um, were basically doing spatial decision making. So there were two targets you could think about there's two targets out there and uh, you know half the group maybe maybe they were they were there yesterday or they knew or they'd been in his case he would train them in the experiments to know about one of the targets and the other half would know about the other and yet the group doesn't want to split so what you find at least in these simulations is that when the targets are too close to each other so sort of the angle between what they see uh, for one and the other is, is it makes it too hard for them to distinguish between them they kind of just Average, orient themselves. Yeah, yeah, they just go just down the middle, right? <laughs> and it's not till the angle gets big enough, so you can think about the, as they get close enough that they can then start to distinguish the two targets. Uh -huh. And then if those two groups of sort of informed or opinionated individuals is equal, then with sort of equal probability, they'll go one way or wow. the other way. And so, you know, one of the big plots, it may even have been on the cover of Nature was essentially a pitchfork bifurcation. If you think about sort of the, which solution, you know, they were, which way they were going, going down the middle was where they were going, uh, plotted as a, as a function of this angle. So, you know, the angle, small, 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 and you just see them going down the middle and then <laughs> there's a critical angle. And then you see, this is a heat map of all these uh, experiments. Then you see they're either going to target one or to target two. It's amazing. And then you could even see when there was an asymmetry in the size of the groups, you could they plotted the same thing, and you don't see the unstable solution, but you can see that certainly more more frequently they go to the favored target, um, but you still see a little bit of um, you know for some initial conditions that were close enough to the other target, you still see some some cases, and it's exactly what you would expect with an unfolded pitchfork, <laughs> supercritical pitchfork bifurcation. So, you know, I, I looked at that picture and I said, okay, that's a pitchfork bifurcation. <laughs> and so there was this, you know, several years of like, come, try, you know, exploring different ways to understand how we might design, you know, this is sort of the beginning of my understanding of what it means to do, at least for me, to do bio-inspired control design or mm -hmm. It's it's not sort of mimicking what the fish physically is doing. It's trying to understand the underlying mathematical structure of, in this case, how it was make the the school was making a decision, and then how ultimately how that was coming out of individuals yeah. making their local decisions, and it sort of led me on the whole path to understanding that learning from nature is not about mimicking it, but understanding underlying structure was essentially abstracting out the principles that explain this remarkable behavior that we observe. And once you can do that, translating it to design, you don't need to live in the same parameter regimes as the natural world, which often doesn't make sense to live in the same parameter regimes because you know design vehicles are clunkier and they have different constraints and different maybe even different objectives, and they don't have to do the same kind of things that, you know. Also with very little, uh, very small amount of parameters, you can generate incredibly rich behavior. Exactly, basically. exactly. But it allows you to go back, you know, it allows you to learn from the, the design system and ask new questions of the evolved system. It also allows you to connect different aggregations, you know. I mean, this sort of led me to what some people say is, you, to me is, oh, you work in so many different fields. But, you know, to me, it's all <laughs> sort of connected, but through our tools, through, you know, these abstractions and then the, the sort of fundamental ideas of negative feedback and positive feedback and these kinds of ideas that, and, and time scales and, and it all comes through these kinds of abstractions. So it's not that I'm saying that there's like a universal principle of everything. It's it's that there are these, these structures that you can then understand and leverage to then explore and investigate. Um, I mean, there's a few examples that I have a sweet spot for, especially the bees that I want to talk about, but maybe I'm just going to pause briefly to mention to our audience what is actually a bifurcation, just for, <laughs> for, for clarity. Every dynamical system has equilibria and equilibria vary, may vary as a function of the parameters of the, the system. And so bifurcation theory is a way to study rigorously what happens to equilibria as we vary certain parameters. 
And uh, as you were mentioning, super critical pitchfork bifurcation is just one of the possible uh, things that can happen to a dynamical system when we vary certain parameters. So what does bifurcation theory have to do with bees? <laughs> uh-huh. <Okay. laughs> so um, I first studied bees when I learned about this beautiful paper in science that Tom Seeley and uh, James Marshall and a group of people had written to try to understand how, well, they were really trying to understand the role of something called the stop signal, which had been understood to play a role in foraging, and they were exploring its role in house hunting, picking a new nest, which honeybees do extraordinarily well and had been very well studied. And in this paper, they were able to show that it played a big role in the honeybee's ability to break deadlock when they're trying to choose a new nest site and they're presented with a pair of nest sites, candidate nest sites of equal or near equal quality. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, historically, it was very well studied and very well understood that this huge swarm of honeybees that is sort of, you know, hanging by a tree, needing to find a new home, can pick the best of N. So N are the candidate nest sites that it goes out, I say it, the swarm. So some of the scouts, so there might be 10,000 bees, maybe three or 400 of them play the role of scouts and they go out and check out, they're essentially cavities in trees and they spend some time, you know, each one, each scout will spend some time checking out, basically getting evidence for the quality of the site. And it's also very well understood What's, you know, the five-star hotel, something like 40-liter cavity with something like a 15-centimeter square opening yeah. that's facing the sun and it should <laughs> be pretty high off the ground. And, uh, you know, maybe if there's some honeycomb left, then it's really good um, from somebody else. And so the, the bees that scout, so a bee will scout, she'll become committed to that site, come back and do what's called the waggle dance on the vertical part of the swarm. This so is super interesting. <laughs> it's incredible. So um, so they do this dance? And they do this dance. Yeah. And, um, you know, this was understood, you know, 100 years ago, and Carl von Frisch won the Nobel Prize for uh, decoding the, the waggle dance. And so it's essentially, uh, it's kind of like, a, you can think of it as like a figure eight. So it basically does this, you know, it's kind of a waggle. It's like a vibration of the abdomen and, but it's on an angle. So this is on the vertical part of the, the swarm and it's on an angle and the sort of the, the length of this, you know, the number of these vibrations is proportional to the distance from the hive to the, um, the, uh, this candidate nest site. site. Yeah, the nest site that the bee's dancing for. And the angle relative to gravity is actually the azimuthal angle. So the, so the angle from the sun to this site, right? And, and really campaigning to go in that direction with also, because I, I remember from watching your plenary, which is also online, there will be a link in the description, of course, the, the number of wiggle waggles that they do is also proportional to how good is the, the new nest, right? Exactly. They, it's, they get more excited. They do these waggles faster and they do more of them, right? So this this notion of the more they do, the more individuals that see it. And so, yeah, so they, if it's, if it's just so-so, they won't do it as, they won't be quite as excited. And then they'll go back and then maybe some of the recruits, I mean, they're essentially trying to recruit. So, uh -huh. yeah. you know, we'll go back with them and, you know, this just keeps repeating. I mean, what's really interesting is that no individual ever is, has any information to make a comparison. No one's ever making a comparison. It's the group as a okay. whole that can choose the best. It's just kind of incredible. But, you know, you start thinking like, wow, if I could do that with a group of robots, it doesn't have to like keep track and communicate so much. You know, this is just kind of recruiting. So if the bee goes back and continually finds that there's not getting a lot of recruits because maybe others, you know, maybe, you know, they were, didn't dance for that long. And so there's not that many that come with them and everybody else just saw a, a longer dance and or more were recruited elsewhere. Then their, their commitment will actually wane. So there's all these kind of things going on. But in addition to this, there is this stop signaling. And so this turned out to be uh, critical if you want to go beyond picking best of N when 
essentially the group can distinguish, you know, so how is it possible that they don't, you know, if, if they're confronted with two or more identical quality sites, how does it work that they don't end up just negotiating forever? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, we might do. <laughs> you know, time. picture yeah. yourself in the supermarket, should I buy this should I, or should I get that <laughs> brand, you know? But these, you know, they yeah. eventually they have to pick one, you know, and they, they know that they, well, they've evolved to, to, to have this mechanism, which is called a stop signal, which is another way, to, it's referred to as a cross inhibition. So it's if one bee is dancing for one site and another bee who's committed to, you know, the other site, is witnessing it, they will, um, it's actually like a headbutt. <laughs> so they're they're basically trying to get them to stop dancing, you know, okay. which is kind of tempering the dance. It just, it's basically speeding up the process of of making a decision. And, okay. and uh, so this group wrote down a mean field, they derived a mean field model of sort of how the fraction of you know, agents who are for option one and the fraction for option two and the fraction that were still undecided were evolving over time as a function of these different mechanisms. And, and essentially, this is what we ended up studying in a subsequent paper, and I guess it was published in 2013, trying to understand. It's actually called value sensitivity or value-sensitive decision-making because we showed that not only is there a pitchfork bifurcation in the symmetric case, right, in the case where these two nest sites are equal quality, and an unfolded pitchfork. So the bifurcation theory teaches you what happens in the presence of a lack of symmetry. So when there are perturbations or uncertainties or other kinds of input, like so maybe there was evidence, a tiny little bit of evidence, it will show us how so super sensitive the, the system is that it will actually make choose the one that's even slightly better. Or it could be just noise. It just essentially allows them to flip a coin. So this was what we studied in this paper, but we also discovered that we could compute, so using these tools from bifurcation theory, we could compute what the bifurcation point was. So what is that critical value? And if if you think about what's going on, it's really the critical value is when the, the linearization of these dynamics has a, a zero eigenvalue. Yeah. Um, and so finding out the value of the parameter, and for us it was the rate at which they were doing the stop signaling. Uh-huh. So the some critical rate at which they do the stop signaling gives you this bifurcation point. And if they were above that rate, then they would make a decision. If they were below that rate, they would not. They would stick at the sort of undecided deadlock position mm-hmm. when half were for A and or option one and half were option two. But what we learned was that the bifurcation point itself is inversely related to the average quality of these sites. Which was super interesting. So that meant that they have some. So suppose these bees are evolved to do stop signaling at a fixed rate. Maybe there's only one fixed rate. So if the quality is really high, that means the bifurcation point is kind of low. So for that rate, they would quickly just flip a coin because they would easily be above the, the critical. Something very good has been found. Something so, very good has been found. And if it turns out that they're equal but poor quality. Then, better waiting. <laughs> yeah, then it's better to wait. Maybe another option will come about, right? And it, you know, amazing. We How don't, collective yeah. intelligence is emerging from individuals that don't have all the information, basically. Exactly right. And then, you know, then we started to think ahead. Well, you know, you know, what if? I mean, we we didn't know whether the bees did this or not. But what if you waited and waited, and there was no third option? So, so what does it mean to have to like? Okay, I just got to pick one of these. You know, <laughs> sometimes you do, right? Yeah. And um. So then you could imagine that there's like a feedback dynamic that cranks up that that parameter, in this case, the rate of stop signaling. So you do more of it so sure. that you can actually make a choice. And Amazing. Um, okay, just one more comment related to the paper, because I remember reading from the paper that also there's a, I mean, this parameter seems also to be related to the speed accuracy trade-off that always exists in feedback control theory. Absolutely. And so that's uh, something that I found also very fascinating. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that, and uh, again, a clarification for our audience, what it means to say unfolding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you use it very casually because you're used to these ideas, yes. I guess. But I mean, there's a, this is a concept that comes from singularity theory that is basically an evolution of bifurcation theory that asks the question of what happens when I may have some perturbations. So it's almost a robust bifurcation theory. I don't know if it's fair to, to call it that way. Yeah, it's explaining, um, I mean, when I say unfold, 
you can think sort of visually of a what's called a bifurcation diagram. So it's a picture of what these solutions, this equilibria look like as this parameter changes. And so it actually looks like a pitchfork on its side because the the handlebar is the um, that or the handle is the um, is the sort of the neutral undecided deadlock solution, and then it becomes unstable, which is sort of the middle fork <laughs> of the pitchfork, and you can picture that as an unstable branch. And then there are the two outer branches of the fork that are the stable solutions. We get this bistability. When it unfolds, it means if there's a you know, any kind of perturbation near that that critical point. And you can think about that critical point as being, again, this place where the linearization has a zero eigenvalue, so ultra-sensitive, right? It's effectively the input-output map uh, gain is blowing up there. So, yeah. you know, it, little tiny input is going to give us, a, you know, something, a, a big output. Um, and so what happens is that the, the, the fork kind of Unfold. So instead of seeing like this sharp point, the you know the you know suppose that that little bit of perturbation was in favor of the like the so the equilibrium for option one, right? It sort of looks like an unfolding of the yeah. the pitch for the picture. <laughs> yeah. So also another clarification for our audience. So the paper that we've been talking about now is called a mechanism for value sensitive decision making on uh, plus one. Again, there will be a link in the description. But then you didn't stop there, of course. Uh, you, you didn't stop looking at anivies. You, you looked at the range of very different animals and animal behaviors. But uh, I think we will have to end it here for today. But our audience can look forward to the second part of this episode, which will be about uh, digging into some of the applications that have been driven by animal studies that I find super fascinating. And I'm looking forward to exploring them together. Well, Naomi, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. Thank you for listening. I hope you liked the show today. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider giving us five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, support on Patreon or PayPal, and connect with us on social media platforms. See you next time.